got it. We are live. This is for the people that watch it later. Hi, Hi everybody. Although if anyone is logged on now, I would be very impressed. There are people in the waiting room. Should we let them in? Uh, hold on one sec. I just want to see if um, probably on Vimeo we'll be able to tell if there's people watching, but we don't need to really know. Um, Harrow, are you putting the uh, captioning in once folks are logged in to access? For in the chat? Yeah. I can, yeah, I can put the link in. Or I thought you were going to put the stuff in the chat, but I can do it now. I just don't have, I don't think I have the link. Oh yeah, I put it in the doc. Ah, okay. I got it. All right, shall I let people in? We can still see your browser tab, but I think it's fine. I can't, unless I present this in PDF, I can't. Ah, I don't, okay. Yeah. Got it. Perfect. Looks good. Hello everyone, welcome. We are gonna get started in just a few minutes. So relax, enjoy the slideshow. If you need captions for this, it's in a separate browser window and you can uh, find them at the link in the chat.
All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Meet the Wildcard Workbook. We're here to talk about and celebrate the, the new wildcard workbook from Theater of the Oppressed NYC. And it's a practical guide for jokering forum theater. Uh, it's a free resource that's now available to download online. I am Harrow Sansom. My pronouns are they, them. I am the operations director of Theater of the Oppressed NYC. I had very little to do with this workbook, but I'm very excited about it. And we're here today to talk with three of the authors. We have Sulu Leonim, Liz Morgan, and Katie Rubin here. And I will let you all introduce yourselves. Um, Sulu, do you want to start? Actually, I might. Let me just check who's on our slide first. Uh, oh, actually, so you're <laughs> you you were first, Harrow, to start. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, who are you? I, I like I said, I'm the operations director of Theater of the Oppressed NYC. Uh, I also co-host a podcast called Thesis on Joan that talks to uh, queer LGBTQ theater artists in the New York area. Uh, also an arts administrator, and yeah, excited to be here. Liz, do you want to go next? Yeah, uh, I'm Liz Morgan. I use she, her pronouns. I currently serve as the director of training and pedagogy here at TONYC. Uh, I trained as an actor and a writer, and then uh, came to TONYC uh, when I started working in the city as a teaching artist. The organization I was working for at the time thought we should train uh, in one of the theater of the oppressed techniques. So I took that training. Uh, and after that, they sort of absorbed me <laughs> into what I thought was another teaching artist job and became so much more. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's who I am. Who's next? Yes, me. Hi, um, my name is Sulu Leonim. I go by they and them pronouns. Um, and I, uh, my relationship to this book, um, I'm currently executive director of, of Theater of the Oppressed NYC, um, but about 10 or 11 years ago now, um, I was a performer and theater artist um, and was collaborating with, a, uh, with my neighbors in Red Hook, um, in the Red Hook Theater Project. Um, and so uh, that's where uh, Katie Rubin came through Red Hook um, with Concrete Justice, um, which became one of TONYC's earliest troops. And I started training with Katie. Um, and then we started building um, with about four or five other collaborators, um, Theater of the Oppressed NYC. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe I'll pause there and uh, hand the mic over to Katie. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am uh, excited to uh, see you all and the folks uh, who are watching on the live stream uh, and uh, excited for today. I am a uh, theater of the oppressed practitioner like Sulu and Liz and uh, former executive director of theater of the oppressed NYC um, and current uh, fan, really, as well as uh, got the opportunity to write this book together with Liz and Sulu, which was a blast. Um, and I live in the UK mostly these days, although I am in New York City right now in Times Square in TONYC's home base. Uh, and I work with legislative theater, uh, which uh, there is a little bit about that in this book, that's more to come, uh, and around kind of creative uh, and equitable policy change. So that's me. Awesome. Thank you all. So excited to talk to you about the workbook. Uh, so we have some questions that I'm going to throw to you, th you three, and then we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, so please keep those in mind and we'll ask for those towards the end. Uh, so let's start with you, Sulu. Uh, besides TONYC's, this is our 10 year anniversary. Uh, what was the inspiration to create this workbook? Um, I recall, um, so I believe it was in 2018, it may have been, but at that point, TONYC um, was, I guess, eight or six, six or so years old, right? Um, and we had had enough, um, 
a number of cycles where we had been training people, um, we were onboarding people. Um, and I, I think Liz and I started talking about like, we really need to like cohere all of our resources. We need, you know, for setting up our own staff um, and for helping our actors train, um, like clarity, put things together, give everybody the same instructions. Um, because I think in general, a lot of our training was focused on learning in practice. Um, facilitators would demonstrate, trainees would repeat back. Um, and we did have a number of Google Docs um, where we had information packets to give to people, right? Um, and then we had internal docs where we're trying to like clarify how we use all these activities. Um, and so we did have a, a bit of a sit down meeting trying to map out um, what would the content of such a resource be. Um, and then um, along the way, a next major step was that um, we received a uh, grant from New York Community Trust. Um, Megan Gomez, a former TONYC executive director wrote that grant um, and got us funding that would support us, not just uh, setting aside the time to do all the writing, but to get professionals um, to help us. And that is what led us to collaborating with CUP, um, whose focus is on creating accessible resources um, to guide people through um, tangly topics <laughs> um, and they had a roster of artists who they work with um, and that's how we um, got connected with Krutika and Shreyas um, uh, and then um, yeah as you know and then the, the work began and I think that is where we got really into much deeper naughtier conversations about what is in this which, because that means also knowing what is not in this um, and what is its focus going to be. Um, we were pretty clear that our audience was going to be really focused on um, our, in a way, our community, you know, wanting members of our um, acting troops to be able to have something that they felt they could go to and start exploring how they could step into the Joker role. And knowing that thinking about it that way would align with like sharing that to a, a much wider audience. Um, I don't know, Katie or Liz, uh, if there's anything you want to add, but. I think that's everything. Yeah. <laughs> and, and now I think, yeah, we, we really started drafting content or taking the content Liz and I had started and focusing it more on this project in 2020, yes, yeah. It's wild to think about how long you all have been working on this and, you know, like the seed of an idea and now it's this, this thing that's free and, and downloadable for everyone. It's really exciting. Uh, for all of you, what do you hope people do with this resource? Katie, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I think that, uh, well, I remember along the way while we've been writing all over Zoom in, in two different countries um, and meeting and editing and writing, um, we said a few times, gosh, I wish this was available when I was starting out as a joker, but really sort of as a facilitator of theater and social justice spaces or arts and like all the kinds of intersections of this. Um, and and uh, so the, to me that says, you know, there's there's amazing books by Augusto Boal who, who started creating the theater of the oppressed and the pedagogy of the oppressed book by Paulo Freire that we reference in this book. And that I think that at TONYC, it's, you know, really sort of a core text for people training or the, the ideas of it. But those books can be hard to read and uh, take a long time and don't, um, for me, sort of didn't always translate into what do I do when I'm in a room? How, how, how does this game work? How does this forum work? What do I do when I'm having a problem? What are all the sort of uh, infrastructural things that go around doing this work that I need to think about, not just the, the philosophy and the ideas. The philosophy is key, but what's about the practical? And I think TONYC for me has always been about multiplying the opportunity to be jokers in a really sort of practical way. What does it mean in the room? So I think that 
that is what I hope that people can really uh, 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 get from this book is, is something that they can wear out, something that they can look to just before a rehearsal or a forum and, and that makes them feel more uh, uh, prepared to actually work with people in all, in all the ways. I'll, I'll pass it on now. Liz, how about you? What do you hope people do with this resource? I'm smiling because Katie's answer was like so much about how we support people, which is definitely a part of Joker work. Uh, my answer is more the, the, the militant, challenging part of Jokering. And I hope this book gets people to re-examine their ethics, right? You know, I, hello, Howl around, And so I'm sure people here are listening from the wider theater community. It has become very normalized to oppress actors in the room to treat them as objects inside of a capitalist machine. And early in our book, we talk about what has become normalized and what this work is doing. And you don't have to be doing this work to borrow some of those ethics and start bringing them into your rehearsal rooms and start bringing them into your classrooms. And so I really hope that that happens. And even if you're doing something that's, you know, not theater per se, but any kind of nonprofit that's, uh, inching inside of that world of, of serving marginalized communities. That entire uh, industry and culture has become, I would say, tainted by saviorism. And our book also talks about that and how we can start to unlearn that inside of our arts programmings and, and make sure that as we facilitate, as we administrate, that we are rooted in the collective liberation, rooted in solidarity, rooted in knowing that if you're going to lead, you can't just be uh, trying to save somebody else. You better be trying to save yourself too, right? And so I, I think this book is really about that. And I hope that becomes embedded in practitioners in, in a really uh, profound way. What you got, Sulu? <laughs> Yeah, um, it's making me think about one of the challenges of being asked to hold space to, to train people um, that often my experience of, of folks um, is that there, there's so much of a focus on like, what is the instruction of the game? Um, and let me make it happen. And what was really exciting in this workbook um, that I realized was maybe I was emphasizing more in our internal um, Joker team's collaborative training was how do you know how do we take care of these debriefs? What are we trying to get out of these interactions? And how important it is to me that practicing TO isn't about trying to get a good product. It is about whatever dialogue we are happening as we are practicing these games and activities. Um, so I think it gave me time to reflect on um, really, oh, oh, right. Like that needs to be balanced into the training. Um, and we would give people instructions, but I think just, you know, the, it's very, I think it's, it's very appropriate, right? When, when you're new to learning an activity that you're going to try to do, that you're kind of focused on like, what do I tell people to do? And did they do it? Um, when in re reality, I think a lot of the jokering practice is like, okay, we're gonna use this activity to explore something. How do I, as a joker, make sure we are exploring what happens via the activity? Um, and so I do hope that the content in the book reminds you know, me to be having that conversation with people, reminds our jokers to be focusing on that care. And then it also helps us as we train our actors um, to say, you know, learning the instructing instructions on the game is really only part of the practice. Um, and that's something I'm really enjoying. You know, I, I think I have been learning in the last week um, through my friend communities of like who else realizes that they and their collaborators or their coworkers or the people they manage are all trying to hold space. They're trying to run meetings. Um, and they're trying to run trainings. And so often people are struggling or suffering through those spaces because they are just given a, a slide deck uh, and then are told, you just like gotta make sure that information is given when really 
the art of figuring out how to hold the dialogue and guide people's understanding through content um, is what needs to make those spaces more interesting for everybody. Um, so there's, you know, the part of me that's focused on like uh, all of the exciting things Liz highlighted about like making sure we keep examining how theater of the oppressed is practiced. And then I would like that to trickle into the, all the other spaces where people are trying to share information and, and have conversation with each other and to continue to make those spaces more fun and more um, engaging and more uh, also, you know, like real. We're really talking about things. Thank you, everyone. Oof, lots of information. Uh, Liz, you got into the ethics of, of TO work and what were the ethics, what were the values behind the creation of writing this? And, and did you discover anything about T1YC's process while writing the book? That's a great question. I'll, I'll focus on two values. And then uh, if my colleagues want to add more, please do. One value was accessibility, right? We try to make our workshops accessible. And so we wanted this resource to be accessible. Uh, and I'll also talk about it being problem posing, uh, which is you know foundational in, in Frary's work. And so obviously in, informs how we practice theater of the oppressed. And so the accessibility part, and I, I think Katie, you, you were the one to bring this into the space, the uh, uh, you know trying to read Boal and trying to read Frary and feeling like this is great. And also my head hurts. Um, and so we, we wanted this to feel fun and fill it with stories and feel, fill it with images. And we were like, you know, we could, we could do it in, in 30 to 40 pages. <laughs> when I look at the fact that that's how short we thought this book was going to be, um, it makes me laugh. And, and so, you know, one thing I, I realized is like be, being accessible is a lot easier said than done. Right. Like we had we had all these critiques of the resources that we were trying to be different from. And then it was like, oh, man, this part, you know, we we'd pre we'd present the thing to, to our collaborators at CUP and then they'd have a follow up question. Right. And so in order to to really make it clear how intricate this process is um, and, you know, it's it's not it's not that I didn't know how complicated this work was. But I think learning or realizing that it does have to be layered and it does have to be scaffolded and that you can't you can't try to give anybody the, the methodology all at once. Right. Like that's why Boal made it in the shape of this tree that grow, like it's, it's such a, a brilliant uh, resource that that Boal, uh, you know, has given us. And, and you know, we, we replicate it in, in the book a bit, but there's. There is so much to it. And I think that also came up in trying to make the book problem posing because I think we could have just filled it with what we think are best practices. We could have just filled it with our stories about our rehearsal rooms. And it was really critical that we create worksheets that ask people to really apply and figure out which part of this is going to work for themselves? You know, we've said it in a lot of our promo, like we want you to rip out the pages and challenge this book and, and really be in dialogue with what we've presented because we know that this isn't the only way to do theater of the oppressed. I don't claim that it's even the best way to do theater of the oppressed, but it's, it's something that is working really well for us. And so, you know, that th there's also a um, tangent. Um, there, there's, a, there's a little icon in the book that we use throughout to indicate where you're going to have to choose a strategy for collective decision making. And there was a moment where we were like, are we going to try to add that in this book, like all of the different ways that people can make collective decisions? And all of a sudden we were like, this book will be a thousand pages if we go into all of the different um, modalities that we are bringing in right that there's a lot of work to be done with anti-racism and there's a lot of work to be done with trauma-informed care and there's a lot of work to be done with collective decision making and all of that stuff has informed how we practice but insofar as this is like a, a book about forum theater and i know kate i think you're going to talk more about some of that later but yeah just it has to be contained but i think what i really realize is that this work is very deep 
Um, and I hope these, you know, 200 pages give people a place to start. Um, but yeah, we might have to make 200 more about any one of those many number of, of deep dives. Uh, yeah, I don't know if, if Sulu or Katie want to add anything about the values. I mean, that just highlights to me that one of my values is making sure I keep learning. And a lot of those areas are where I've like, that is where I have been training, trying to get um, training as a facilitator. Um, uh, we brought in some amazing people um, years ago to start to develop how our Joker team would have a, a trauma-informed uh, practice. Um, Kiria Traber was a theater artist I knew and worked with, and we, we've uh, also offered our staff a, the ability to like explore those spaces, whether that's kind of going into folks who have very specific mental health responses or theater practitioners who have developed their own um, uh, training for change. Um, came onto my radar a few years ago um, and seeing that they were really trying to think about um, popular education and facilitation. Um, and then, and yeah, and like, you know, I took a, an interesting training, I'm forgetting the name now, but like also in like understanding indigenous consent and consensus practice, practices. Um, and then as we're, we've been working with the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives on our own internal structure, seeing more resources um, about collective decision-making options um, and strategies and how each gets, you know, th that is all, you know, like if there's a value in this book, it's also knowing that like the reason why we can't put that content in the book is also knowing that we've got to keep learning as jokers um, and expanding and being a participant in the spaces and seeing what works and what doesn't. I'll just chime in about the learning that um, one of the biggest joys for me Wow, I'm going to get emotional. I'm, I'm over here in New York City. Everything's making me emotional. Like the honking is making me emotional. Okay, so don't mind me. Um, uh, was learning from Liz and Sulu. So, and I think like TONYC, uh, you know, usually works in co-joker teams for the exact reason, well, for many reasons, but for the reason that one person is never the perfect facilitator or solver of any problem. And People have different skills and different expertise and different awarenesses, and different privileges, and different on all of that. And we need we 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 bring those together to do a better job. We're still not going to hit all the things, right? And 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 so, like, and I think that you know, sort of just we have two. We have a value that everybody can be a facilitator. Everybody can be an actor. Says and everybody can be a joker. And at the same time, like excellent facilitation makes me want to cry. Just be because it, that is a super power tool for, for the change we need to see. Excellent to me. And 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 Liz and Sulu, like I I trust my facilitation life with. <laughs> so it was so amazing to take different parts of this process and write them and then go, whoa, like. I never could have expressed that that way. And I, that just opened my whole eyes to something new. I never would have written that down. So, and, and now I think about it a whole different way. Um, and, and again, like if, if one person can't hold every kind of facilitation or decision-making space, one person maybe also can't write a book like this because you need that kind of checks and balances. So um, that, was, that was something wonderful for me. Thank you all. I agree. I, I don't identify as a facilitator, but I've learned so much about it from the three of you. So I'm, it's amazing that you can share more information with folks. Um, Katie, we've talked a little bit about what this workbook isn't. So what is this created not to do, aka what's workbook two going to be about? Workbook two, we're still recovering. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we learned uh, not just about all these other things, but also how to write a book uh, and to write a book with illustrations. So, um, but I think that there's lots of things. One was, and we said at the beginning, there's a lot of books we know and appreciate and love that are sort of more academic reflections 
uh, on the impact or evaluations of theater of the oppressed. Those can be wonderful. Um, this is not, this is really about practically uh, what's happening in the room, including Katie. Uh, your sound just cut out a little bit. Will you jiggle your uh, microphone? I think the plug into the computer might be a little wonky. Is that better? Hmm. No, it's still, we can hear you. It's just quiet. Um, I can Maybe take off take, the headphones. Oh, that's better. That's better. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Okay. Tell me if it doesn't, if there's a problem again. So it's not that. Yeah, it's not that kind of academic reflection. And it also isn't covering every part of theater of the oppressed, right? So there's a tree of theater of the oppressed that is in the book uh, and that many people have seen in different spaces. Um, and there's rainbow of desire and cups in the head that are techniques about it working on internalized oppression, but they often feed into doing forum theater and TONYC has used them that way. There's legislative theater, which TONYC has done a lot of exploring about, about working on changing policy using forum theater. And there is a section on that in the book, but it doesn't go into all the specifics about, and, and, and questions really, about how to involve policymakers and advocacy partners and organizing groups and how to structure the play. And we started writing that and thought again, that's a different book. We really, you know, to Liz's point about accessibility, like let's be clear about what this is going to be for. Um, so there's many more parts of theater of the oppressed. And as Liz and Sulu have referred to, there's lots of other kind of, I think the other thing is there's lots of brilliance about facilitation that we were inspired by that we weren't trying to copy because other people did that better already, right? We looked, uh, at the workbook on uh, conflict resolution, uh, or, or that's not the right word, yeah, public towards repair uh, by Mariana Makaba and her collaborators. And that is a, that was like one of the inspirations to us of something that was really interactive and sort of engaged you as a user and reader and, 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 and person. Um, and those, again, like those, there are so many resources like that that I think a facilitator needs to work through all of them at different points. Um, so those are some of the things I think that part of what will, if there ever is another book, it will also come from what the questions are of the people who have used it and where they feel like there's something that they need to know more about, which is exactly what we want to know now. And what is, is really exciting about this period. I don't know, Liz and Sulu, anything else I'm missing? I'll just add, um, yeah, that because you mentioned that workbook, I, I did get to take a, a trip, um, transformative justice training in 2019. Um, and uh, that really, like those practices, um, transformative justice, restorative justice, and community accountability, I think really did impact my facilitation practice. Um, and I just kind of wanted to mention, because I know we are on the live stream, um, and there are resources that people are putting in the chat. Um, so just being able to mention verbally, um, that book, as well as I know um, Tony here is, is mentioning a space called East Side Institute. I've shouted out facilitator cards um, and the consensus decision-making training I took was with um, groundwaterarts.com. So I'm putting that verbally in our archive um, for those who are not seeing the chat. This may be the more practical answer, but I also just wanna name that like, it's not a nonprofit management resource, right? Uh, we are a nonprofit, we're doing this work inside of a nonprofit, but we recognize that people may be finding other ways, maybe more liberated ways to do this work. Um, so, so yeah, like take, take that, um, you know, and anything that we do inside of that context, take it with a grain of salt and we try not to go too deep into what that means. Um, and yeah, we, it's on the cover, but just to reiterate, it says forum theater, like, because that's, that's as far as we could get. There's a chapter uh, mostly authored by Katie Rubin about legislative theater that's really great. Uh, Katie Rubin also just worked on uh, another resource um, uh, with part uh, a participation playbook um, that you can find. Uh, I don't know if anyone has the link and can, can drop it in there, um, but from People Powered that's uh, different but also similar. Um, in terms of, of an interactive way to think through how you can create legislative theater. But I think our future books um, 
we'll probably go even deeper into some of those other techniques. Oh yeah, it's not available yet, but we're so close. <laughs> awesome, thank you for all those amazing resources. Uh, I'm gonna do one more question to the three of you before we open it up to the audience. So audience members, if you wanna start putting your questions in the chat and then we'll, we can get to those after this. But for the three of you, what is your favorite part of the book? And if you wanna share a little bit about why so folks can definitely look out for those. Um, Sulu, you wanna start? Uh, actually, I was going to ask to go last so that I, I have my choices in balance in case anybody else had them, but I'm also going to share screen. So since Ooh, I'm yes. doing the tech, who, Katie <laughs> or Liz? Can yeah, Liz? well, if, if you want to pull it up, I, I think we found it on page 75. Um, oh. So if, if you've ever taken a training with us, we will do like a, a drawing of the dramaturgy arc. And so, yeah, on page 75, 76, uh, we draw out uh, something pretty similar to what you might've seen in a, in a training that, that shows you what a story looks like, the protagonist, their need, being told no by the antagonist, and then the failure. But what I love is that this workbook also shows you uh, what happens during the forum, that we jump back in and that actually the story changes. And so I hope, I hope it's clear uh, but y'all let me know, um, you know, find us on social media, let it, let us know what's clear, what's not clear. Um, but yeah, I really love this spread. And, um, again, shout outs to, to Shreyas and Krutika, because we went back and forth so many times about how to make it clear. And they, uh, were just so awesome about all of the little nuances that are required to, to make this book what it's become. Do we have time for you to, to just mention, you know, the, the cycle? Oh, so, yeah. like, oh, what the, um, what the little loop-de-loop -loop is? <laughs> or, or just, just the, uh, the, sh the shape. The shape, yeah. yeah. So in, in forum theater, um, you know, you'll, you'll have a protagonist that has uh, something that they need that they have a right to. Uh, something that, uh, yeah, a, a, human, a human right uh, or including maybe even just uh, expression of identity. Uh, in this story, we have someone named Jean-Pierre who needs to find housing for himself and his partner. And then he meets an antagonist, a, a landlord that refuses to rent to Jean-Pierre uh, when, she, or refuses to renew the lease when she realizes that Jean-Pierre wants to, to move in his same-sex partner. So that's somebody saying no because of who Jean-Pierre is and, and uh, or who she perceives him to be. And so we have this moment of crisis where uh, Jean-Pierre has uh, equal opportunity to, to, to get what he needs and be denied. We end up seeing uh, that story end in failure or an unsatisfying compromise. Um, so in, in this version, let's say Jean-Pierre and his partner break up because of all the stress around finding uh, housing. And so, yeah, then when, you, when we see the play again, that little moment of crisis actually becomes a place where intervention is possible. And so a spec actor would get to come in, interact with the antagonist um, and might try something like calling a lawyer. And then the actors play out, uh, you know, what, what might happen when you call a lawyer and maybe you get some new information, um, but maybe, maybe some of that new information <laughs> includes that court fees are expensive. And so maybe we still end in failure. That doesn't mean that these stories always end in failure, um, but just to understand that the, the story kind of keeps changing every time we have an intervention. So this spread along with the pages before, the pages after, it's not just this diagram, um, but uh, I, I really like the visuals of this and, and what Shreyas and Krutika uh, put together for us as far as this was concerned. Thank you, Liz. Mm -hmm. uh, Katie, do you wanna share? Sure, mine was uh, mistakes we try not to make. Uh, shorthanded, <laughs> unhelpful intentions. <laughs> uh, and page that's on, on page 30, I think. Um, and somebody else wrote this first because we all sort of split up the sections. I think it might have been Sulu. Uh, it wasn't me. Um, and uh, I love this. Well, it's funny, first of all. 
Uh, and I really love that a lot of the book is funny, like makes me laugh out loud. I think that, I mean, we like TONYC prioritizes fun and considers fun a crucial ingredient to the revolution. And so fun was a baseline, uh, you know, or to whatever revolution we're trying to do at that moment, let's say. Uh, and, to, and fun was a baseline value of creating this book, you know, illustrated, like colorful, beautiful. Um, and, uh, and also I think that laughing is part of that. So the fact that it's funny and, and I think also that we try not to make means that we do make them again, no one is a perfect facilitator. I think, you know, as Liz said, again, TONYC is, is, has so many strengths and a lot of practice and learning in this kind of stuff and is also ongoing learning and making mistakes and all of us make mistakes. And I think that that sometimes I would say in a joker training that that is to me, the definition of a joker is that it's the person who goes home every night and plays over the video in their mind of what happened and said, where was I biased, right? Where did I miss something? Where, where did I not do that, that real problem posing and, and job towards, towards liberation that, that I'm trying to do? And there was definitely somewhere and what can I learn from that? And so all of these mistakes, right? I will teach people about oppression this makes me laugh, but they're all real. And even if it's hard for us, I think sometimes it can be hard for us in a, in a live space to admit because we know this sounds bad. So it's kind of having it on the page is like, then I can go in my private head, oh, that's true. I have done that, right? Um, I am unbiased, just absolutely impossible. I never oppress anyone, definitely. Maybe not impossible, but certainly not true for me. Uh, I am saving oppressed people, right? I am serving oppressed people. There might be one more on the next page. So is there, does it end on the next page? No, it's just the notes, right? So, and then there's actually this worksheet about how do I relate to, to power add oppression. some. Yeah, yeah, add some. And how do I relate to power, oppression and, and privilege is, is a worksheet that I think is really important for, for jokers to do that kind of conversation with themselves and with each other. Um, so I love that for all those reasons and more. Uh, and the text it, uh, next to each of those uh, little, uh, you know, speech bubbles is just uh, wonderful. Stop. We are all biased. Stop. Yeah, that's me. Thank you, Katie. And Sulu? Yeah, I think I really want to highlight, um, there's a couple pages here and uh, the so often people would come to me at the end of a training and be like, so is it okay to do a forum theater if I'm working in this kind of space? Or is it okay if I do forum theater if I'm working with, with this particular group of people? Um, or is it okay to do forum theater with this kind of story, right? Those were the, the um, questions, like even though we would hold open question time in the training, they would like hold onto them like like a private, like, wait a second, I need I need the expert to check in with me on this. Um, and, and actually, that's not true. I'm now remembering there were some group group discussions in training. But so we, we held a little space in the book to try to help folks think through that, because um, we certainly can't judge right? Um, but I think it really, what we were trying to do here is like navigate, how do you have that conversation with yourself and with the people you think you want to make forum theater with? Um, how do you ground yourself in people understanding what it means, um, you know, because saying like, can we make this into a forum play? Does kind of need people to understand what that means. However, I know as a practitioner that so many people don't really understand what forum theater is until they've done it, right? You, you make the play, you do the interactive forum, um, and then people, you know, even if you practice it in private, you do it in public, and then everybody involved is like, oh, whoa. So it's hard, you can't make it perfect, but how do you um, navigate some conversations about like, okay, this is a version of the story we're gonna use you know, for a public conversation. Um, and we're going to, you know, have, you know, imagine who might be in the audience. Um, is this how you want to present this problem? Um, 
And I think um, there were some questions like, you know, is it okay to ask people to share their stories? Which I think is also related to like, you know, asking if they want to, thinking about the power dynamics of who is the asker and who's being asked. Um, one of our focus groups while we were developing this book um, moved into a really um, specific conversation around the power dynamic of being able to say no to a facilitator. One of our actors shared that really his life um, was about any, any group space where there's somebody in charge. Um, he uh, has felt that in order to be okay, he has to say yes. Um, he's not allowed to say no or decline um, a request of him. And it was only via being in multiple rehearsals um, with our facilitators um, of realizing that, that he was being offered that option. Um, and I think it's, you know, it was multiple years of being in that space before he realized that like he could start using the word no. Um, so no, being aware of that, um, and then this question, which I think a lot of people started asking us as an organization and as facilitators was like, are we re-traumatizing people? Which I also think is, is a conversation that needs a lot of, of care um, and getting more experience with understanding what does that question mean and how to have um, conversations with the people who are, are participating, because I think what we noticed was we were mostly being asked that by people who were outside of the room, um, who thought as social service providers, they needed to protect the people who were in the room. Um, whereas many of the people in the room were often being told they shouldn't share the story in case it was traumatic for them. Um, so these, some of these dynamics of, of power um, uh, in spaces, is not allowing people to connect with other people who have the same experience um, and, uh, and be creative or have support. Um, and, you know, I, I, we could not offer these things in, in the book as a map of like, this is when it's okay and this is when it's not, but we really wanted to flag some of the considerations. Thank you all, yeah. Uh, and there are so many great pieces in the book. I'm glad you all got to talk about some of your favorites. Uh, jumping to questions from the audience, we have one from Pablo. Uh, his question is, how, will the, how do you think the book will impact current TONYC participants? Uh, I don't know if someone wants to take that, maybe add what does it mean to be a TONYC participant? Oh, what does it mean to be a uh, <laughs> hey Pablo? Um, what does it mean to be a TONYC participant? Um, I, I don't even know if I have like the, the best answer for that, but um, for those that don't know too much uh, about our organization, uh, majority of our work is done in partnership with uh, social service organizations or city agencies. Uh, and what those organizations might typically call their, their clients. Uh, when we partner with them, we, we ask if we can uh, turn them into actors, right? Um, not necessarily thinking that we are going to, uh, you know, tur turn them, uh, you know, into professional performers for life, but actually into people that are taking action in their lives on on a consistent and regular basis so that's what we mean by actors um but yes also they would be performing with us and so then we spend 10 to, to 12 weeks uh working with those that participate in creating a forum theater process and our book has how we map out a 10 to 12 week uh rehearsal process so that's typically what it means to be a participant uh in tonyc programming and so the question is uh how do we think the book will impact i i'm hoping and again, I, I do think the best way to, to get your feet wet in this work is to be doing it in your body. And I think, yeah, I think Katie just said like some, or no, Sulu, right? Some people don't get what it is in, until they've done it. Um, I think after that, people have a lot of questions. And I hope this book 
can help answer it. It's like, well, so why did we make this choice and not that choice? And then either, you know, a joker can point them to page whatever in the book and say like, well, the theater that maybe you've seen before might look like this. This is what we're doing. And then folks can know like, oh, it's, it's not that TONYC is just making this thing up, but that there's actually uh, a lot of intention behind this work. And so I, I hope this book can maybe answer some of the questions about why our work doesn't look like other things that people might be used to or other programs that people might be used to, why we use the term joker uh, instead of instead of teacher. Like, I think I, I've worked with some troops where they want to call me professor and I'm like, Wait. like, I am not Professor Morgan. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm hoping it can do some of that. I don't know if Sulu, Katie want to add anything. Just that I think, like we said before, sort of the, the idea that anyone, you know, everyone is an actor to take action in their lives and in the world. And then everyone also can, can therefore be a facilitator to move other people, to move themselves and other people. So, and, and TONYC has a long practice and very developed practice that, that Liz leads and everybody does of, of right, of, of like supporting actors to become jokers. And that's where lots of folks who are jokers in, in TONYC who are part of the staff. Um, and so that is another resource to support that too. And Especially in so far as I think it lays out how complicated that work is, because I think sometimes jokering looks easier than it is. And so I actually, in, in some ways, I hope this can make folks go like, oh, everyone can be a facilitator, but does everyone want to be? And I think that's a real question. Um, I'm glad that we actually had one actor be like, wait a minute, this is a lot of holding space. I don't know if I want to do that. I just want to play. And that and that's totally legitimate. Um, but yeah, like j j jokering is hard work that you have to hold space for other people and do a whole lot of other things. And so I want that to be laid out a little bit more clearly before folks start getting their, their hopes up about doing this work because um, it's, it's challenging. I think I cut you off, Sulu. I just wanted to add a little thing, which is like that we have, um, we have shared training but something that I do as have done, you know, as for me to learn the games and activities has been like, I'm always going back and reading through the instructions. Um, you know, the night before training being like, right, what do I have to hit? And now we have that more available to people. And I know we have somebody who's, who's watching who um, holds a lot of space in organizer meetings. And I know there's somebody here who also was like, you know, I wanna play some of these games with the kids in my building. Um, and now I'm hoping that they have that, um, you know, in their pocket on their phone, you could like sit down and be like, what's, what, what do I say on that game again? Or even have it while you're doing the game. You know, I, I think there's no shame in, in having points of reference um, while you facilitate. Um, so I'm hoping that it could be, uh, you know, spreading that that way. Great, thank you, Pablo. Uh, another question from Liz, a different Liz. Do plays always need to be performed for an external audience or can they just be used to stimulate, activate participants? Katie, you want to start with that one? Me? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, I think, well, I don't know if, if, I mean, I think there, to me, there always needs to be a, a forum in that a play is not an answer or play is a question. So there needs to be an opportunity to open that play up as a, as a problem. We've got a problem. What are we going to do about it? But we can be our own audience and figure that out ourselves. Like, you know, I remember at TONYC times when we were having an internal struggle and like nine months later, we would go, oh, we should make a forum scene about that <laughs> in our retreat meeting. And then, you know, that's actually what we do in our work. That's how you can look at problems a different way. And so that's our, we're the audience of the people who are facing that problem and trying to change it. So I think that that is the, a great use of this tool um, and that is to me that's the same any external audience is somebody who watches something and somebody who thinks about how to take action and that can be we are each other's external audience or we bring in the rest of our external audience what do you think yeah a lot of our uh residencies and troops culminate in what we'd call an internal performance 
that's for maybe folks at that same organization. Maybe they didn't help build the play, but folks that saw them rehearsing and were like, you know, what's that little theater group doing? And so, you know, there are varying degrees of, of public. And, you know, I know Sulu, you just worked on a, a project uh, in your neighborhood uh, where at a certain point they were like, oh, we, we don't know if we want to perform. And the, the whole idea of producing sounds like a lot of work. And then you, you ended up uh, leading them in making a zine. Uh, which again, I, I don't, <laughs> this workbook definitely does not teach folks how to make those kind of pivots. So I'll, I'll, I'll make that very clear. Um, but that's why, again, we want folks to, to be thinking, uh, about all of the other skills that you can bring and infuse and apply with theater of the oppressed. So that if you do come across a group that all of a sudden is going like, yeah, we shared stories and we used some of these techniques and now the idea of, of sharing our stories to a public audience is no longer feeling good. You have to have options. And so my, you know, my answer would be um, may, maybe a little slightly different than Katie's like, you don't always have to forum, but you, you always have to be pursuing uh, concrete, ethical, uh, direct action and, and figuring out like, what's, what's the next step um, after you've done this work. Cool. I do. Uh, we have one more question from Tony and then we'll wrap up. Uh, curious to know if young people around school age have been emerging jokers and what challenges and successes have you seen that have swung it for them to develop or have let it go due to other commitments or issues going on for them? Uh, Sulu, do you want to start? Sure. Um, we have... Um navigated that um, shift and there are so many challenges um, that I think are you know somewhat mostly external right um, young people who are in high school or are not in school but are like <laughs> still you know eight 16 17 18 um, have been trained trained with us have worked with us and we know that they're also navigating um, how do I pay rent? Um, how do I, if I'm being asked to support my family, how do I support my family? Um, and then, uh, so, so there's, there's figuring out um, uh, how to be supporting their learning and supporting them understanding how to continue to, to show up um, in our various spaces while, while they are, maybe their life is going through some big changes as well, right? Because they're leaving school or they're leaving home. Um, and then there's, I think the other challenge I'd like to mention um, is um, being in spaces and being always perceived as, uh, well, you must be a youth participant. Um, and then having the struggle of, of trying to get their work done either, it's not often so much that like the people they are facilitating say that, but the people controlling the space or the spaces. Um, and even now we have a couple of folks on our team who I think right now are 23, um, who started training with us when they were in their late teens um, and were showing up to a high school um, and were having security guards who were like making sure they couldn't come into the space until some grown up from the school came down the hallway and vouched for them. Um, so, I, you know, um, there's, uh, I, yeah, there's the, the challenge of maintaining a, like a creative, a, a creative art practice. I mean, I, as an adult, like, how do I maintain a creative art practice while also paying for rent? And then the ageism that people face. I'll say that. Yeah, and I'll also add that, like, we're, in, we're encountering some, or I would say, yeah, almost all of the young people that we encounter, we're encountering them separate from anything that has to do with their parents, sometimes very intentionally, right? And so if there are folks that have parents that maybe aren't in alignment with this work or know that it's okay, but it's a priority for them to maybe do, be doing something else, you know, young people can often overcommit, right? They say they're going to be at rehearsal and then they text us, oh, I'm actually supposed to be going prom dress shopping with mom. And, and so, you know, we could probably figure out like a strategy to, to make sure that when folks have, have parents and guardians that are, are present in that way, that they feel a little bit more collaborative with us. But that, that's an issue that has, has come up in the past. Uh, there may be one other thing that I was going to say, but now do I remember? Oh, power dynamics, right? 
I think, you know, Sulu, you're talking about what it's like to show up at the school, but even just between co-jokers, if someone like me, you know, I'm, I'm about to be, uh, you know, 34 on Monday, right? Co-jokering with one of these people that, that, that Sulu was talking about that's closer to 23. And then even taking race into account, say they're co-jokering with, with Katie, who's, who's white, right? We're going to default to the person who's older, has more skin privilege, all of those things. And so I think that's also a, a question of how do you provide mentorship that also allows young people to step into their own and see themselves as an equal co-facilitator in the room and not always lean back and say like, oh, well, well, Liz has been doing this for longer so she can do the agenda planning. Like, maybe I shouldn't be doing the agenda planning. And, and de-mechanizing that on both sides uh, is really challenging work, uh, but I, I try to lean into it as, as much as possible. Thank you, Leo season is here. <laughs> Thank you all. And thank you for the questions. Uh, we are at two, so I want to wrap up. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this discussion. Thank you, Katie, Sulu, Liz, for your amazing answers. Um, if you want to join us in person, we're going to be down in Battery Park at five o'clock to toast this workbook. So come meet us, come schmooze with us. We'll have some snacks and drinks. Uh, you can also save the date. We're having a 10th anniversary party on Saturday, September 24th. More information, location, and all that coming very soon. You can donate to us uh, at tonyc.nyc. The book is free to download, but it was not free to make. So if you feel like donating, you can do it on our website. You can also volunteer. I run our volunteer program. We'd love to have more people help us out. Uh, and we have a, a, a donation campaign coming up called Represent, which will put our slides up and there's information there on how you can join. So you can be a fundraiser for us if you're interested in that. It's a team effort. It's a lot of fun, uh, pretty simple. So thank you all again for coming. It was lovely to hear your questions and your feedback. Uh, you can find this stream on HowlRound if you'd want to come and revisit it later or share it. Uh, and yeah, Katie, Sulu, Liz, you want to say any final goodbye things? Spread the word about the book. Let your facilitator friends know how to download it. Seriously, take level two training with Sulu um, and let us know what you think about the book. Hit us up on social media. Thank Yay! You. Thank Woo! you all. Thank you, Harold. Bye, everybody. Bye.